Well, good morning, Grapeview friends. Here we are, Thanksgiving Sunday, 2020. Uh, it's been it's been a long bunch of months in our COVID pandemic here, and uh, again this weekend it seems like. Uh, the pandemic has really interfered with a lot of our sort of family connections, uh, activities regarding Thanksgiving weekend. But uh, we do here in this space, as we come to the Lord, as we gather as his people, uh, we have a different story to tell than uh, what our politicians and our health professionals uh, we have a story of thanksgiving in the midst of this. That's the, the nature of the faith that we have in Jesus Christ. This Sunday, of course, as Thanksgiving Sunday, is our tier fund uh, special collection. And so if you have an interest in contributing to the tier fund uh, project, you'll see the, the video clip here online that you can... Uh, take a view on the kind of work that Tier Fund does as our partner in global relief and development work, uh, a group that I really personally have uh, a really good connection with and uh, value the, the approach to relief and development work that they take. And uh, so if you'd like to make a donation, uh, one of those various means for uh, contributing, we'll make sure that it gets in the right direction. So we're on a journey with the people of God from slavery in Egypt through the wilderness to the land of freedom. Last week, we left the story with the people at Mount Sinai remaining at a distance from God. They had seen the mighty acts of God, but they didn't want to draw close to this God who has freed them. So they sent Moses up the mountain to talk with Yahweh. They were happy to have God provide for them, and they promised to obey God's laws, but we don't actually want to talk to God ourselves. That was the story in Exodus 20. Now, up on the mountain here, Moses spends a long time, possibly up to six weeks, uh, if we gather this from the record. And as you read from chapter 20, where the Ten Commandments were given and this conversation with God, to chapter 31, God's essentially laying out for Moses up there on the mountain what it means to follow him, what it looks like to worship him, what it looks like to live as a distinct people amongst the nations, in line with the covenant, that mutual promise that the people had made with God. And so that's what's going up on, uh, on the mountain with uh, Moses and Yahweh speaking and, and talking about the character and kind of the, the ways that things should be done if you're going to be my people. Now, if there's anything we've learned about these Israelites, it's that they're impatient and grumbly. And that's where we pick up our story today. Exodus 32. When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said, Come, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what's happened to him. <laughs> there we have it. Impatience again not willing to wait on God's timing. They're blaming Moses, this fella who brought us up from Egypt. Do you notice how they're actually reframing the story to suit their own purposes? And that's, that's why we need to keep telling the true story. Our society today continually wants to mock and, and tell this Christian or retell this Christian God story in a way that suits the interests of whatever legal system, philosophy, spirituality, tells the story of scripture in a, whatever way they want to. And they're just, in that sense, following in the paths of the Israelites here, trying to make up a story um, that isn't accurate but suits them. And so, our friends here want to make up a God. 
Make us a God who suits us, who will go before us and as we travel to the promised land. So what kind of a God did they have in mind? They wanted a God that worked for them. What did that look like? Well, the only gods they knew were the gods of Egypt. And so if they want a God, I think it's going to be something like they had back there in Egypt. They remembered the processions, the celebrations, the tangible gods that were carried through the streets and you could walk up and touch them, you could see them. That's the kind of God that they wanted because that was the only God they knew. Interestingly, up there on the mountain, God is literally talking to Moses about building an ark, a sacred box that the people uh, will carry as the presence of God ahead of them as they move through the wilderness and into the promised land. We might ask, well, so what's the difference between this calf God that they wanted to make and the Ark of the Covenant here? Well, the calf was made by the people themselves. It was not God's initiative. The ark that would be built in the years to come would be God's initiative. So they were, in, in effect, kind of taking on God's role for themselves. And then that calf was a, a metal thing with no life. The ark was actually going to carry the glory of God, like the pillar of cloud and fire that they saw around them. This ark was actually going to carry something of the actual presence of God. And then the third thing is that this was a created thing, an image of an animal. And this was something that God had specifically, that was one of those 10 things. If you get it right, Israel, do these 10 things. And right there, within weeks, they're deliberately going against what God had asked of them. Well, here's how it all happened. So Aaron answered them, their call, make us a God. Take off the gold earrings that your wives, your sons, and your daughters are wearing and bring them to me. So all the people took off their earrings and brought them to Aaron. He took what they handed him and he made it into an idol cast in the shape of a calf, fashioning it with a tool. Then they said, These are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of the calf and announced, Tomorrow there will be a festival to the Lord. Now remember that Lord in capitals is the English translation of Yahweh, the personal name of God. Tomorrow there will be a festival to Yahweh in front of this calf. Something to think about. So the next day the people rose early and sacrificed burnt offerings and presented fellowship offerings and afterwards they sat down to eat and drink, and got up to indulge in revelry. Now, we could say a few things about Aaron, of course, Moses' brother, who's the one who sort of facilitated all of this. Because literally up on the mountain, right now, while this was happening at the base of the mountain, God is telling Moses, I'd really like Aaron to be the high priest, my mediator. Wow, that's quite a, a contrast. God's desire for Aaron, and yet Aaron is facilitating this pagan ritual here. So you can see that uh, Aaron's focus was in a different place. He's coming up with some kind of half-mixed-up concoction We've got a golden calf that kind of represents the type of gods they had back in Egypt. But we're going to call this god Yahweh. It's a festival to Yahweh. And Aaron ends up with this religious gobbledygook. <laughs> it's interesting because I, I think sometimes 
We actually see this amongst Christians who mix up, up a bunch of our own human ideas and opinions with the word of God rather than actually letting God's word stand on its own as the, the grounding of our lives. Well, let's carry on. Now God turns and sees what's going on at the foot of the mountain. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go down, because your people, whom you brought out of Egypt, you got that? This is the Lord <laughs> talking to Moses. Your people, whom you brought out of Egypt, they've become corrupt. They have been quick to turn away from what I commanded them and have made themselves an idol cast in the shape of a calf. They've bowed down to it and sacrificed to it and have said, These are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. I've seen these people, the Lord said to Moses, and they're a stiff-necked people. Now leave me alone so that my anger may burn against them and that I may destroy them. Then I will make you into a great nation. Well, as you can see, uh, God is pretty uh, frustrated, angry, ticked off with this situation. He's had enough. You'll remember I've been saying over the past number of weeks that all along God was working with these people recently released from slavery in Egypt. He was working with them as you would with little children, patient, answering their grumbling with miracles. Well, now it seems he's stopped being patient. I'm going to destroy them and start over again with you, Moses. Did you catch that? God's fed up with this million or so people. I'm just going to destroy all of them and start again with you, Moses. That's kind of like the, the Genesis story. Uh, God started over again with Noah, started over again with Abraham, and now, Moses, I'm going to start over with you. Well, this was Moses' response. But Moses sought the favor of the Lord his God. Lord, Yahweh, he said, why should your anger burn against your people, whom you brought out of Egypt with great power and a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say, it was with evil intent that he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to wipe them off the face of the earth. Turn from your fierce anger. Relent and do not bring disaster on your people. Well, Moses enters into intercessory prayer with God for this ungrateful people. God wants to destroy and start over again with Moses, but Moses talks back to God in prayer, if that's what conversation with God is. Look, these are your people, God, Yahweh, they're not mine. You chose them out of all the options that you had. Secondly, you, you've already done so much for them to bring them this far. Is that all just going to be a waste of your time? And finally, you know the Egyptians are just going to laugh at all this, right? Those people worshipped a crazy, messed up God, so it serves them right. That's what the Egyptians are going to say. Yahweh, turn from your anger. Change your plan. That's Moses' prayer conversation with God. And then finally, Moses concludes... Remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, to whom you swore by your own self. I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, and I will give your descendants all this land that I promised them, and it will be their inheritance forever. Then the Lord relented and did not bring on his people the disaster he had threatened. Remember the promise you made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Then Yahweh changed his mind. He changed his response. Humanly speaking, according to the laws of justice and fair play, 
We might say that God had every right to be angry and to impose some kind of punishment on these people. But with Moses' intervention here, this interceding on behalf of Israel, instead of anger, God chose to extend grace and mercy. In our psalm this morning, Psalm 106, there's a recognition of God's mighty acts on behalf of his people. There's a calling for acting justly, for doing the right thing. The psalmist, however, recognized that Israel ignored God's miracles. The psalmist acknowledges their sin, the falling short, the wrong, deceitful actions of this nation. The psalmist says, they forgot the God who saved them. And yet God offers grace and mercy out of his great love. And that is a powerful good news story. But before we go to the good news part, I want us to recognize something. Yes, it says they sinned, they did wrong, they acted wickedly. Those are all kind of concrete, tangible actions. But where did those concrete actions of rebellion begin? I think the psalmist helps us here. They gave no thought to your miracles. They did not remember your many kindnesses. They forgot the God who saved them. Those are all processes of the brain, processes of remembering. It's interesting that our brains actually tend to recall negative experiences more readily than positive experiences. We sort of mull over negative experiences. We rehearse what happened and of course, what I'm going to say or do in response to that thing that happened to me. Do we do the same thing with positive experiences? Hmm. I wonder. I, I think that we actually have to be very intentional about remembering good things. I don't think it just they just pop up in our mind. I think we have to be intentional. about remembering things for which we're thankful rather than focusing on the things that are a problem or the things that we don't have. And I think that's been a little bit hard for uh, many of us to do in this time of COVID. There are a lot of negative things that are filling up our brain space in these days. And they may be leading us in the same direction as Israel. They gave no thought. They did not remember. They forgot. But we are called to be a different kind of people. A people with a hope-filled story. A people remembered by a God who is full of great love. Yes, a God who may take us into the wilderness, but this God does not abandon us. The question is, are we recognizing God's presence with us? Are we recognizing, remembering God's provision for us? Are we remembering the good things, the miracles, during these days of struggle? Well, that's the word of encouragement we have from Paul today as well. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. Now, Paul's been talking about the grace of God, and he wants to point his people, the believers in Philippi who came to saving faith through his ministry in that city. He said, you've got to stand firm. And he's going to give us some hints on how to do that. Rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. 
The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now, you see what Paul's doing here? It's about mental perspective. It's about how you're choosing to let your brain process life that's happening around you. Paul says it starts with rejoice. It's an attitude of our heart and our minds. But then there's an acknowledgement that worry and anxiety does emerge in the natural course of living life every day. The question is, what do we do with that anxiety and worry? Paul says, turn those anxieties over to God with thanksgiving. It's an interesting way he puts the phrase together. Speak out your anxieties, lay them before the Lord, but with thanksgiving. Well, this is a good weekend to be reading this passage, isn't it? Thanksgiving. Well, and when we've turned those anxieties over to God, we leave them there. And his peace will guard our hearts and minds. We do our part, and God will do his. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about those things. Whatever you've learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. So we have to focus our minds. We have to fill our minds with something other than negative worries and anxieties or other kinds of distractions that lead us to forget God's goodness. If, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, that's where our focus should be. That's where our thinking should be. Paul knows that this is mind stuff. It's mental work. In Romans 12, too, Paul says, we're transformed by the renewal of our minds. Jesus Christ has done his work of forgiveness and healing our broken, bent souls. But our minds need to be renewed. We need to intentionally reflect on a new story, an excellent story, a praiseworthy story to reshape our minds and our practices, our habits. So this Thanksgiving Sunday, I'd like to give you an assignment. I hope you'll take the time to watch the short Thanksgiving chair video clip that's right here on our website by the message. And then this week, will you make a conscious decision at least once a day to pause and think about something for which you're thankful in your present circumstances. And give a smile and say, thank you, Lord. Simple, yet very challenging, actually, to make this an intentional practice. See if you can do that once a day. Just pause Say something thankful. That's our word today. And uh, I trust that in, as you celebrate Thanksgiving with whoever it is that you get to <laughs> this, uh, this Thanksgiving weekend, that uh, you will be reminded of uh, the processes that we need to pay attention to, of our minds, of remembering of not forgetting let me pray eternal father we thank you for your goodness and mercy you have had compassion on us although in our foolishness and forgetfulness we have wandered away from you and grieved you in your great love you have received us anew 
and forgiven our offenses through the loving sacrifice of your son Jesus. We're thankful for your loving kindness, your infinite mercy. We do not want to grieve you by ingratitude, by disobedience to your holy will. All that we are, all that we have, all that we do, we consecrate once again to your service and your glory this day, this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord be with you, friends.